Thank you for joining us. My name is Lillian Muli, and on Women in Leadership tonight, we ask you, as always, to send in your questions, your comments, using SMS number 22422, or using the hashtag one on one. Now, Dr. Kizzy Shako is a medical practitioner working under the Division of Forensic and Pathology Services, Ministry of Health, Kenya, and currently seconded to the National Police Service as the first ever female police surgeon. She has received training in various fields of forensic pathology, namely dead body management, disaster victim identification, post-mortem examination, and death investigation. She has in-depth knowledge and skills in clinical forensic medicine, including injury interpretation, adult and child sexual violence, and non-accidental injuries in children. Now, given the nature of her work with victims of violence, she started a blog titled Vunja Kimia, which means let's break the silence. She's my guest in studio this evening, Dr. Kizzy Shako. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me here. I, I forgot to say, the lovely <laughs> Dr. Kizzy Shako. Oh, um, so let's begin with the fact that you dissect bodies, um, you take pictures and write <laughs> reports, and you actually worked at the city mortuary for three years. Why would anybody choose such a <laughs> chilling, <laughs> creepy career? <laughs> I always wanted to do that actually. Um, since I was a child, I was like, ooh, this is so exciting. For me, it's exciting, it's interesting, I'm curious, I'm very inquisitive. I like to get to the bottom of things and try to figure out, you know, put the pieces together. So it's a passion that never really died. Mm -hmm. So when the opportunity was there, I was like, yes, send me to the city mochi. And yeah, what was I your first? It. What was your first experience, um, you know, coming face to face with a dead body and actually having to dissect it? Because I, well, I don't know the technicalities of what you do, but just being so close to this. <laughs> dead body, what was your first reaction like? Well, you, you didn't want to chicken out and just say, okay, this is not for me. No, I was so excited. I couldn't wait. But you see, uh, my first experience was in med school, in your very first year. Anatomy, you have to dissect to understand what goes on in the body and all that. But then in the mortuary, no, it was different because it's, it's not a cadaver. It's someone who actually was walking around, living, breathing, and then they died for whatever reason. But it was, I mean, I liked it. I was happy to finally have gotten there, like mm -hmm. finally, all these years later. Mm -hmm. I find it very interesting, actually. Okay. Yeah. So um, let's now cross over to what you do. By the way, Dr. Kizzy Shako is the first and only female police surgeon in the country. Um, so what does your job entail? And, and take us through a typical day, listening to, for instance, the heart-wrenching stories of a child who perhaps has been abused or a woman that was battered all night by her husband. What's a typical day for you like? Yeah, pretty much that. <laughs> Every day for me is uh, a day packed with one, one sad story after another after another, like even 40 or 50 of them, sometimes up to 80. Um, so there's a lot of sadness involved. Um, we see a lot of children who've been injured and abused by caregivers, a lot of women who've been abused by their partners. We also see some men, but most of them are women. Uh -huh. um, and it's sad, you know, and I realize a lot of these things are caused by ignorance, so that's why I, I really write a lot of articles for my blog to try and educate people so that it can be avoided. It's actually avoidable, in my opinion. Right. Yeah. Um, and my sound guy is asking you to project kindly. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, let's talk about, you know, just again, just going back to 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 the stories that that are related to you when you have to ask a child what happened who did this to you how has that shaped your view of humanity just uh, having to deal with some of the gross things that are done to the vulnerable and it could be a woman it could be a child it could be a man how has that shaped your worldview well uh, I, I find myself asking all the time, like, what is wrong with people out there? What kind of person does this to another? How do you just, you know, kill or beat someone to this point? You know, it, sometimes you get people being beat to death, and then you have to see the perpetrator and be like, uh, it's very tempting to ask them, really, you know, we shake them up and ask, what were you thinking? So um, it's made me very cautious. I'm very cautious and then I'm more motivated to, you know, reach out to people and tell them these are some of the things you need to avoid, mm -hmm. you know, these are some of the things you need to look out for and be cautious about mm -hmm. and to encourage people to help each other out, love each other, respect each other instead of always fighting and squabbling, you know. Yeah. What kind of questions do you ask? For instance, 
if I went into a police station and asked for a P3 form and I came to you because um, perhaps somebody beat me all night and maybe there's really no evidence to show that um, maybe I don't have a scar, maybe I'm not swollen anywhere. What kind of questions do you take victims to? Um, well, okay, when victims come to the police surgery for a P3 to be filled, they've already been seen elsewhere and they have to have a medical summary. So they all have injuries somewhere. Um, what I do is ask them for the history. I want to understand what happened, what provoked it, because I also like knowing more about it, you know, the context in which it took place, mm -hmm. so that I can know what, you know, what, what recommendations to give. Um, where were they injured? I have to look at the notes and examine them as well, and you know, to verify because sometimes people lie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and then give recommendations after assessing their mental status as well, because that's something that's overlooked. Are they okay? Are they safe? Where are the children? What more do they need? Where can they go? Uh, surprisingly, most people don't know where to go or who to report to next. They don't even know why they are there. So I, I tend to give that kind of information. Yeah, and it's good that you pointed that out because uh, a lot of people are asking what is the process. Um, so you pointed out that before you go for a P3 form, you actually have to go to a hospital first. Yes, mm -hmm. please go to a hospital first and make sure they document, the doctors or the clinicians document everything on the medical report. Mm -hmm. And you come with, a, you know, if any investigations were done, like x-ray, CT scans, come with that and its report as well. Mm -hmm. Because we need it to compile, you know, to come up with a conclusion as well. So if, if that is being done then at the hospital level, so what is your mandate then? What exactly do you do? Now I feel the P3, and the P3 acts like an exhibit, mm -hmm. which will be used in court should that, should it get to that level. Okay. Yeah, so okay. that's what it's for. But there are other doctors who do it as well, mm -hmm. only not in the same, you know, not as many patients every day. Right. Yeah. How many patients per day are you dealing with currently in the country? Um, only in Nairobi, though. In yeah. Nairobi, yes. Yeah, in Nairobi, uh -huh. it can be anything between like 40, 50 to up to 100. A depending day? Yes. Okay. Me, myself, but the police surgery itself will see about 100. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about children per se, um, and uh, there's been an increase in, 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 in numbers of child abuse um, reported. Um, what do we need to know about child abuse? Let's talk about the numbers because you gave us an overall view that you deal with about 40 to 50 persons per, per day, but how many cases of children do you deal with in a day in as far as abuse is concerned? Okay, for sexual abuse, it's a daily thing. Monday to Friday, there will be cases of defilement. Um, physical abuse and the other forms of abuse will come maybe about eight in a month, sometimes more, sometimes a bit less. You talked about sexual abuse being the highest per day. There's always a case Every of a child day. that has been abused. Not one, like six, seven. What eight. do we need to know about child abuse? Who are the main perpetrators? Those closest to the children, mostly. Um, so there's fathers, stepfathers, um, neighbors, security officers, those are the commonest. Mm -hmm. Then you'll have the strangers. Um, teachers also are very common. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and most people don't, don't realize it can actually happen to them or their children. So it's something I encourage people. I mean, it's, it's hard to grasp that, you know, maybe your husband or someone could hurt your child, but it happens. So, you know, I just talk about it so people are aware this is something that happens. So when the child comes to you, who relays? Um, what happened to you? Is it the child? Is it the guardian? Is it the mother perhaps? Who actually narrates to you what's been happening to the child? I Is the child and the law actually um, allowed to speak out to mm -hmm. you for instance about what has been done to her or him? It depends on the age. Um, the older the child like around 14 onwards they can but we, I prefer not to because it's you know re-traumatizing the victim. So I ask the investigating officer because they'll have, they also have more facts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I prefer to do. Okay, mm -hmm. and preventive measures, um, because I know you've dealt ex exhaustively with this issue, preventive measures that could keep our children safe in our homes and neighborhoods. For that parent that's watching, what do they need to know? Um, well, preventive measures. Well, they need to first understand that children are extremely vulnerable. They are not little adults. <laughs> they are actually children. They don't understand how to express themselves the way we do. They don't know what's dangerous and what's not. So we always have to look out for them and supervise them at all times. You know, a lot of times, um, some of these cases I see, you'll hear the child was outside playing alone, and I'm like, 
so you know what were you thinking <laughs> you know mm -hmm. so exercise caution always like it's I can't overemphasize that yeah. and look out for signs of abuse or trouble um, I encourage like for the older children parents should be aware of who their friends are what they're doing when you know they're out there who are they spending time with what do they do with their phones what are they watching listening to mm -hmm. um, because um, like r of course like um, recently I've been seeing a lot of girls who are pregnant teenage pregnancies and they say that they ran away from home because they didn't want to go to school because some guy somewhere told them you know let's go have some fun and they they just left so you need to understand what kind of pressure is, is, uh, is around your child. Mm -hmm. yes. Intimate partner violence, and, and um, I'm asking this because I'm reading up your blog, uh, Vunja Kimya. Um, I saw an article about, uh, about narcissism and how a lot of times people are in abusive relationships. It could be emotionally or even physically or sexually, mm -hmm. uh, but they're not aware because if I'm dating you or I'm married to you, um, chances are if you do something to me I will not want to report you to the police station mm -hmm. so what how common is intimate partner violence very common the problem is people don't report it like you said and most people don't even know that's what's happening to them and even when they know like they're it's something difficult to actually register in your mind as oh my god this is actually happening to me um, so but we see about what I see about 15 cases a day of uh, intimate partner violence just break it down for us what does that exactly mean intimate partner intimate partner violence is um, when you have a, okay a relation when there are two people who are in an, an intimate relationship so that's a boyfriend and girlfriend ex-boyfriend or you know when you have a boyfriend or ex-boyfriend, husband or ex-husband, and it, it vice versa also applies. So that's when there's violence um, between, amongst those groups of people. Mm -hmm. And the uh, violence is anything from emotional abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, financial abuse, all those uh, are, mm -hmm. you know, make up intimate partner violence. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, for once again, just about intimate um, partner violence, how can a woman um, because there are those that come to you repeatedly, I'm sure, with the same stories, with the same stories over and over again. He did it again, he did it again, or she did it again, she did it again. Mm -hmm. So how can a woman or a man survive, escape, or totally avoid this <laughs> type of abuse? Educating themselves, you need to, you know, knowledge is power. You need to understand and know some of the things to look out for in a person so that you avoid finding yourself going deeper and deeper into a relationship that is potentially hazardous because people do die from this. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen women with fractured facial bones and I'm like, oh my goodness, you need to help her. So yeah, just educating yourself on what to, to look out for, that's, that's the most important thing and that's why I write about it. Mm -hmm. so someone somewhere will read it. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, so you've been writing, Vunja Kimya is a blog that Dr. Kizzi, um started, um, which means break the silence, like I said before. Mm -hmm. So you started this blog, what has been the reception, what have, has been the reaction um, to you actually um, writing down about people's experiences, what they've gone through, how are people responding to this, are people actually speaking out about what they've encountered, what they've gone through? Yes, people do. First of all, what I write, I receive consent first. <laughs> um, and yes, people do reach out to me. Um, a lot of people find that it's an opportunity for them to share what they've been feeling. Like my last article was about a lady who shared her rape experience and she wanted it you know shared and she felt it was a relief it's very therapeutic mm -hmm. so I encourage people to just share talk about it it really does help speak yeah. about what you've been feeling what you've gone through it will help you and others it's extremely therapeutic and you know concern from a bulk of parents um, whose children are in campus or even the young career woman um, and, and I want to narrow down to careless partying where um, a bunch of girls go out to a club and or you go out to a club with your friends and the next day you wake up and you're in this strange place with mm. this strange man mm. in this strange home we know there's been a lot of spiking mm, of lot. drinks um in, in 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 different entertainment joints how to actually stay safe so that you don't find yourself in such a situation what do you tell people who come and tell you <laughs> that i don't remember what happened i was in a club and the next day i woke up in this strange place i don't know if i was raped i don't know 
the person that I was with, I don't know if I was infected, if at all there was sexual intercourse. How do you deal with that? First of all, how to stay safe? First, how to stay safe. <laughs> if you can avoid partying, <laughs> that's the first thing. I know it's difficult, but yeah, that would be the best way. But um, what I encourage people to do is just be careful with their drinks. You know, putting a drink in a glass and then leaving it because it's with some guy you're sitting with. You don't know what he's planning. You don't know what he's thinking. Mm, there's a lot of uh, women, what's the word? Um, like women who sell their pimps. friends. Yes. yes. <laughs> There's That's female pimps. That yes, is a fact. there are yeah. very many. Um, and they actually sell their girlfriends out to these other guys. So you really need to be careful and cautious and not be too trusting. I find young people extremely trusting. They mm -hmm. just overlook so many things that they shouldn't. So that's that's the best way to go. Yeah. yeah. Somebody is asking, before we take tweets, Dr. Kizzy, mm -hmm. uh, somebody is asking, so what happens if, if I suspect that um, what should I do if I suspect that I was perhaps raped unknowingly or even knowingly mm. um, before I go to, rather, where's the first place I should go? What should I do first of all so that I don't interfere with the evidence? Mm. <laughs> go to a hospital immediately, like as soon as possible. Because the first thing the victim wants to do is take a shower. Yeah, I know everyone wants to shower, change, get rid of their clothes and, you know, just bathe and scrub and scrub. Please don't do that as hard as it may be. I can only imagine how difficult it must be, but please just go to a hospital first. Let them examine you, document everything, collect specimens, then take a bath. Mm -hmm. You can take a bath and they'll collect your clothes as well. They should collect your clothes and put them, you know, package them appropriately. And then from there you can now shower and, mm -hmm. and everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we want to take your tweets. Um, let's see what you're writing into Dr. Kizzy Shako. Steve Mbogo, you're saying Dr. Kizzy Shako is an ultimate hero for venturing into a career that not many can fancy or dare practice. Mm -hmm. um, Samuel Otido, you're saying proud of my former classmate, she has brought flair to forensic pathology and police department. Nyachila, you're saying Dr. Shako, kudos, you speak up for the Kenyan voiceless, bless always. I really like the courage that Dr. Kizzy Shako is embracing in her work. <laughs> She's not a he. <laughs> uh, Stephen Omondi is saying, Citizen TV Kenya, wow. I think the doctor is an inspiration to the young girls who are working smart in life. Okay, um, I probably want to get your parting shots, Dr. Kizzy. As we close, because you've started um, this campaign for the voiceless, you're an advocate, which yes. is basically just totally going beyond the call of duty for you. Why the need to go beyond what it is that you're mandated to do and actually <laughs> seek help for the voiceless? Um, it's difficult to watch people in pain and not to do anything about it. I don't know how others do, but I can't. So I just got time because I, I have all this knowledge and I thought... Let me use it and, and help these people, help everyone to, to be able to learn how to respect each other and try and reduce the violence that's going on around us and help others know what to do. Those who already hurt to, to receive healing and restoration. So that's why I, I, I do what I do okay. and I love have it. Have you encountered any form of abuse yourself? Yes. <laughs> you have. I have and that's part of the reason I'm so passionate about it because I, I can... I got over it and I can help others and I understand them. I'm not judgmental like most people are. Okay. So, yeah, it's a good place to be. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. We've been talking to Dr. Kizi Shako. She is, you know, she brings a very friendly face to the police force, <laughs> which is usually mean and harsh. So she's, um, you know, well, perceived to be mean and harsh. Yes, I'm not saying they're mean be. and harsh. <laughs> Dr. Kizi Shako, Kenya's first and only female police sergeant, and of course, the only female forensic pathologist we currently have in the country.